Around 4,000 years BC, at the start of the Neolithic period, the first inhabitants of the Iberian Peninsula slowly began to transform the ecosystem with the introduction of agriculture and cattle rearing. Today, 6,000 years later, the forest which once covered the entire peninsula has been reduced to just a small series of small islands dotted across the Spanish landscape. In 1979, the Spanish government, worried by the disappearance of this important natural habitat, declared one of these islands a national park. The choice was not random. Covering an area of almost 18,000 hectares and containing two-thirds of all protected species in the Iberian Peninsula, the Monfragüe National Park is today one of the world's last remaining paradises of the Mediterranean fauna and flora a unique enclave where man seems to have achieved the difficult balance between exploitation and conservation of nature. Both inside the park and in the area surrounding it, there are meadows with oak and cork trees, the result of the constant influence of humans on the landscape. The forests have been cleared and bushes removed in favor of the pasture necessary for the development of intensive cattle rearing. Along the steepest slopes, plant life has remained unchanged and shrubs cover the forest floor. There is very little variety of fruits on the meadows, but there is one which is very abundant and very nutritious, the acorn. The seed, produced by the oaks and the cork trees and greatly appreciated by the wild boar and domesticated pigs, is also the favorite food of one of the most common birds in Monfragüe, the wood pigeon. The abundance of cork and oak trees means that every year there are plenty of acorns for all the animals of the park. However, coming down to the ground to gather them can be a very dangerous business. While the wood pigeons are busy filling their stomachs, a stealthy enemy lurks nearby, watching. A wild cat has heard them and has approached. This feline prefers to hunt at night but the presence of so many pigeons together is a temptation he can't resist. Hunting during the day is much more difficult. The birds are wide awake and visibility is much better, which means the wood pigeon can spot the danger and fly off. The wildcat represents one of the final links in the food chain, the system which decides who eats who in nature. At the bottom, holding up the entire structure, are the rodents and the insects. Just above them come the reptiles, like this oscillated lizard, the largest lizard in the Iberian Peninsula. The lizard, in turn, is often eaten by the wildcats. All the links in the food chain are dependent on each of the others, and any change in one link will affect all the rest. The wildcat's future seems uncertain. The reduction in the numbers of rabbits, one of its main food sources, combined with the gradual loss of habitat, means that numbers are down to worrying levels. And there is another problem. 
Crossbreeding with the domestic cat. More and more domestic cats can be found up in the mountains and they breed with the wild cats. This is almost impossible to control and pure wild cats like this one are increasingly rare. Another of the predators of Monfragüe, the genet, was introduced into the Iberian Peninsula by the Arabs in the 8th century AD. For a hundred years it was a valuable ally of man. It is an excellent rat and mouse catcher. However, the domestic cat took over this job. The genet was used less and less by man, and today they are entirely wild. The genet was forced out of the barns, but it found an ideal natural habitat here in the forest. There were plenty of birds, rabbits and mice, and few predators to worry about. It very quickly adapted to life in the wild and spread throughout the peninsula. Once man's inseparable companion, it soon came to be considered a dangerous pest which killed domestic fowl and small game. The friendship turned to hatred and the genet was persecuted by the descendants of those same humans who had introduced it into the country. The genet will happily eat fruit, but it is mainly carnivorous and prefers hunting at night when it can take advantage of the fact its prey is resting. Its sight, smell and hearing are all very acute and thanks to its sharp retractile claws it can climb up tree trunks and reach even the most inaccessible nests. Its agility and skill in hunting make it one of the most efficient predators in the forest. The reduction in the numbers of rabbits as a result of myxomatosis and hemorrhagic viral disease have meant an increase in the number of reptiles hunted. Some species like the ladder snake, which in the past was just a small part of the diet of the carnivores, has now become one of their main foods. In the dark enclosed areas of undergrowth, the Ichnemon, the only European member of the mongoose family, searches for alternatives to the rabbit. Nowhere is safe for the ladder snake. Not here, not out in the open spaces where the eagles are constantly on the watch for potential prey. It will be under ever increasing pressure until the rabbit again takes its natural place in the food chain. In the extreme northwest corner of Monfragüe, where the Tagus flows out of the park to the right of the river, lies an enormous mass of quartzite rock. This is the Salto del Gitano, the Gypsy's Leap. Here, protected between the vertical walls, lies one of the summer visitors to the park, the Black Stork. Every year, 30 pairs of storks arrive in Monfragüe to breed. They are shy, solitary birds. Not only do they build their nests in inaccessible places, but also as far from each other as possible. If conditions are right, nests can be several kilometers from each other. As well as rocky outcrops, they build their nests in the large oaks or cork trees in the park. This is also the preferred nesting place of its close relative, the common stork. After regurgitating the fish and amphibians they have managed to catch to feed their chicks, the parents perform the strange stork ritual.
The ceremony is repeated several times and serves to strengthen the bond between the couple. This is very important as these birds stay together for life. The impressive stork's nests, which in some cases can be as much as 3 meters across and weigh 50 kilos, are the result of continuous repairs and improvements, which the male carries out every year before his mate arrives. During the winter, they separate only to be reunited the following summer, here at the same nest they left the year before, and where once more they will hatch and raise their young. The behavior of the common stork and the black stork is very similar. In both cases, the male arrives first to get the nest ready. The females arrive later, and in the course of a week, they lay the eggs, one every two days, up to a total of no more than five. With the birth of the chicks, one month later, the real work begins. In the first stages of growth, the chicks can double in weight every day and both parents take turns looking after the nest and searching for food. Their task will only be complete when, at the age of two months, the chicks are able to fly. Though biologically they are very similar, there is one difference which has been decisive in the lives of the two species. The white stork is able to live alongside humans, and so numbers have remained stable or even recovered after a time when its future seemed in danger. Unfortunately, the black stork seems unable to adapt to the urban environment and its habitat is reduced a little more each day. Not even here in Monfragüe is the stork entirely free from the presence of man. Extensive sheep and cattle rearing is one of the traditional activities permitted within the park. The ecological damage it causes is minimal and more than compensated by certain advantages for the wildlife of the area. In return for the grass they eat, the cattle or sheep leave a very valuable gift of their dead. Every time a sheep dies in Monfragüe, a complex system goes into action in order to dispose of the body. The first to arrive are the jackdaws and the crows, the largest corvines in Spain. They can be found throughout the length and breadth of the Iberian Peninsula thanks to their ability to live alongside humans and the fact they will eat virtually anything from seeds to dead bodies. The Egyptian vulture, the smallest but most rapacious of all the scavengers of Monfragüe, has also seen the sheep and immediately swoops down to devour it. Both the Egyptian vulture and the corvines will have to hurry because they cannot possibly compete against the dominant scavengers in the park, the griffin vultures. The Egyptian vultures have better eyesight and spot the body first, but as they fly down, they are seen by the griffin vultures. One griffin vulture sees them and starts flying around in circles above the spot to alert others. Very quickly more arrive and soon the sky is full of scavengers. So many vultures flying around in circles can mean just one thing, and spurred on by hunger, this fox decides to take advantage. Despite their size and strength, the vultures would not dare confront this competitor, and the fox can enjoy his banquet in peace. Meanwhile, up in the sky, dozens of eyes watch and wait impatiently until he has eaten his fill and their turn comes. Finally, the fox moves off and the vultures descend on the body. In just a few minutes, 
It's covered by dozens of famished beaks. Hunger and aggression will determine who gets to eat. As a vulture satisfies its hunger, it does not defend its place so ferociously and is ousted by another who has not yet eaten. Yet another species of vulture can also be found in Monfragüe, the black vulture, the largest bird of prey in the Iberian Peninsula and very rare. The park has proven to be an ideal habitat and numbers have risen. Monfragüe is now home to the largest colony of these birds in the world with over 250 pairs officially counted. While the different species of vulture fight over the body, one of the most primitive mammals in the park, the hedgehog, scrambles around the forest floor looking for insects, which form the basis of its diet. Little does he suspect the fox has picked up his scent and is after him. The hedgehog is hardly a fast mover, and the chase is quickly over. When he sees his enemy approaching, the hedgehog rolls himself up into a ball. According to folklore, the fox should now urinate over him to force him to stretch out and let down his defenses. But traditional wisdom is not always right. In reality, only the eagle and the eagle owl know how to get through this primitive but very effective system of defense. After sniffing at the hedgehog for a while, the fox soon gets tired and heads off looking for other victims. The hedgehog unfurls and makes a run for it. Meanwhile, the black vultures have also found the dead body. They are less gregarious than other vultures and are normally to be found alone or in small groups. Each one searches for its own food, so it's normal that only one or two have been drawn here. Numbers of black vultures in Monfragüe have gone up from 70 pairs in 1979 when the park was created to over 250 now. This is just one example of how important the decision was to protect this oasis of Mediterranean life. The powerful beak of the black vulture allows him to eat even the toughest parts of the animal. As he rips off the skin, he opens the way for the griffin vultures, who plunge their long, featherless necks inside the sheep to get at the intestines. The introduction of intensive cattle rearing with the cattle kept in stables meant a considerable reduction of food available for the vultures, leading to a general reduction in numbers. If there was no extensive cattle rearing in Monfragüe, they would have to bring food in artificially to feed the colonies of scavengers that now live there. Bit by bit, the black vultures extract the muscles, tendons and cartilage from the dead animal. These are the parts they eat, and as soon as they have got what they want, they move away to eat alone, leaving the other vultures to fight over the intestines. As the banquet continues, the fox returns. If he hasn't been able to hunt anything, he will just have to eat more dead sheep, even if that means first scaring off dozens of vultures. Of all the scavengers around the body, only one dares to stand up to the intruder.
Despite his strength, a single black vulture is no match for the fox. The majority of Monfragüe is mountainous terrain and it's crossed by two rivers, the Tagus, which flows right through it, and its tributary, the Tieta, which runs into the Tagus in the north of the park. Both were dammed up in the 1960s in order to generate electricity. The construction of the dams had a profound impact on the ecosystem of the area. Many forests alongside the rivers were flooded and the fish were no longer able to migrate up to what until then had been the wild waters of the Tagus. The water stagnated and became warmer, and so many species of fish were only able to survive in small streams or in the upper reaches of the river. Further downriver, they were replaced by new species such as the barbel, the black bass, or the perch pike. The new visitors were more resistant to higher temperatures and lower levels of oxygen in the water and were able to thrive in rivers which, because they had been abandoned by the autochthona species, contained very few competitors. On the other hand, the number of different species of birds increased, drawn here by the calm waters full of fish and away from the pressure of humans. Today we can enjoy the sight of herons fishing in the river or the mating ritual of the great crested grebe, another of the many species of birds that come to Monfragüe to breed. The couple will repeat the mating ritual over the next few days until they start to incubate the eggs in nests built on the water. The heron has chosen the same rocky outcrop as the black storks on which it's built its nest. The storks, in turn, fish in the same waters as the herons and grebes. The autochthonous birds and those introduced, directly or indirectly by man, are in constant contact. They share the same environment and have been able to find their place without upsetting the ecological balance of the park. All of them now form part of this ecosystem and the loss of one species would rob the park of its extraordinary variety and richness. Meadows, virgin forests, crystal clear streams and waters held back by the dams, Monfragüe's Mediterranean forest and much more. For 6,000 years, men have lived here and respected the natural environment. Man's past and man's future. A unique combination where conservation and exploitation have achieved that difficult balance which it is man's duty to strive to maintain. <laughs>